Would you all uh, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 111 and follow along with me? It says, Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endures forever. He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will ever be mindful of His covenant. He has declared to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of His hands are verity, or that is truth, and justice. And all His precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. If you would bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to You today to praise You. Lord, not only in the song... Lord God, but uh, as things are come to remembrance during the music and even during the message, Lord, we want to praise you. Lord, just being here is a statement, Father. But we just, I just ask that we would all lift our hearts and our eyes to know your heart, that you are in the assembly of the congregation as we are today, Lord God, and that your works are great and they're certainly studied, Lord God, that we should study them. Lord, help us to study them more. And more often, all that you do is honorable and glory, glorious, Lord, and help us to know that your righteousness endures forever, Lord, that your righteousness has been imputed to us, and that's all we have, and it's on that promise only that we can stand. Your wonderful works, Lord God, all that you have created have been uh, created to be remembered, Father, and we should honor you in that also. You are gracious, we thank you for that graciousness and, Lord, the compassion you've shown, Lord, how you are, are, are slow to anger. Lord God, you are, 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 are slow to anger, Father, and you are, are so quick, Lord God, to enter with your mercy and your grace. You are true and just. And, Lord, I pray that we would remember that as we go through the, the word today, the message, Father, that um, you have prepared for us, Lord, as we seek in our own lives to try to understand all that happens, knowing that we will never understand all of it, not on this side of heaven, but Lord, that you're, but we hope, I pray, that your divine providence, Lord God, would be anchored in our heart and that we would all know that you have a plan and that nothing has taken you by surprise, Lord. The fear of you is the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of it. Lord, so if there's anyone here today that does not fear you, that does not know you, does not love you, Father, has not known you, does not know you as their Savior, Lord, I ask that that begins here today. Lord, and we ask that your praise would endure forever from this place a house of prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you all would turn in your Bibles to Genesis 46, we're going to start in verse 5. I am going to attempt to get to on into chapter 47. I've entitled this The Great Sequester. And if you're keeping up with a timeline, if you're one of those like me who likes chronologies and knowing where we are in history, you can jot down 1706 B.C. That's where we find ourselves according to the uh, biblical chronology here. Sequester is a term that is vital to this part of the Genesis narrative. And that means, the term sequester means to separate or set apart. Now that should not be a foreign concept to someone who's been a Christian for, for any length of time because it parallels what we call sanctification, which essentially just means to be set apart. And once again, this should be familiar to us. If it isn't, then I hope that we can remedy that today. 
So we're going to pick up with the story now as the family of Jacob begins to head south towards Egypt um, as they have now been invited. Now they're, the trip now will be a little quicker because they're riding in the uh, equivalent of a, a Lincoln um, because Joseph sent carts and stuff, real good carts, not ox wagons and stuff that's barely getting down the road. He sent that in order that they can come back to Egypt. So in verse 5, chapter 46, we start with this. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones and their wives, in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him. So Jacob leaves nothing and no one behind. And this, you have to know this and appreciate this, I think, to help frame the context because this is a total move and one of great faith, I might add, because all the land that they own is simply being left. They're just up and leaving. You know, there's no fence, you know, around it. There's nobody to lock the door of the house or what have you. They're just up and leaving. All that the family owns is being left behind. But Jacob has to know. He has to know in his mind that one day they will return. This is, but this is one of the promises that we discussed him turning over in his mind uh, last week as all of these things are rolling around and he's being told to come down to Egypt. Now, all that that's been mull- he's been mulling over, now that faith is being put into action. He has feet on his faith. It is one thing to say you have faith. It is another thing to act on it. You know, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, the old song, Money Talks, is in, I won't say the next line, but it's a old oh, rock tune. It's not bad. I'm just not going to say it. But now that their faith has been put into action and the family is pulling out of Canaan, no one is staying behind to mind the store. Now think about that. You're just going to walk off, leave your home, even if you've got an HOA. You know when you come back it's going to be full of letters because the grass has grown up and the squirrels have eaten holes in the soffit and everything else. They're just leaving. All they have inhabited has been left looking like a ghost town. And it's at this point that we now get into, we have a list and a genealogy of those that went down to Egypt. And now we will study the deep meaning of every one of those proper nouns. No, we won't do that. It would behoove you to study, especially in Hebrew, uh, what a proper, each proper noun means. But um, <clears throat> start, start, starting in verse 7, it says, His sons and his sons' sons, that would be grandchildren, his daughters and his son's daughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. Now these were the names of the children of Israel, Jacob and his sons who went to Egypt. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben were Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. This has got an asterisk by his name. That's not good. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar were Tola, Puva, Job, and Shimron. That's not the same Job from which the book is titled. The sons of Zebulun were Sired, Elon, and Jalil. These were the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram with his daughter Dinah. All the persons, his sons and his daughters, were thirty-three. The sons of Gad were Ziphion, Haggai, Shunai, Esbon, Eri, Aradai, and Aralai. The sons of Asher were Jimna, Eshua, Isui, Beriah, and Sira, their sister. And the sons of Beriah were Heber and Malchio. These were the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bore to Jacob, sixteen persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, were Joseph and Benjamin. And to Joseph in the land, finally get some names that are easy to pronounce. And to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, 
whom Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin were Bela, Beker, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. This almost sounds like a fairy tale. <laughs> Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. Winking, blinking, and nod. These were the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. The son of Dan was Evan. No, that's our Dan. The son of Dan was Hushim. Hushim. The sons of Naphtali were Jazil, Guni, Jezer, and Shilam. These were the sons of Bilhah, whom, whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter. And she bore these to Jacob, seven persons in all. All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's sons' wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. So there were 70 that were blood-related to Jacob, and this is whom the, the list counts here. This is so important. I know people don't like reading genealogies, but you have to understand the importance of them in that culture, in oral culture. This, you keep up with this, and someone in the family, the patriarch, continually runs through these, and you know for generations and generations and generations back who, who all your kinfolk are. Now, most of us can't, <clears throat> you know, I can go back a couple of generations, but past that, I don't know. <clears throat> and you might discover the more you dig, the less you want to know. But the point is, this is one of the things that historically, because the Bible does not get the credit it deserves for being a complete history, not only of creation, but of society and, and, and uh, anthropology and and culture, uh, you know, you go to college or high school and you learn these things and all oh, the Bible's poo-pooed and all that. Do you realize how much information is here? You don't get this in pagan histories. And you don't get it in any secular history outside of the pagans. It's only here that we have the place names and the people and the, the children and how many went who were, were born to this wife and this and all that. That is a wealth of information that only adds to the credibility of the Bible. So only 70 go in, of, th and of which thousands will come out, but only after 215 years of slavery. If you work out the chronology, they're, they're in good standing for 215 years. Then comes along a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph, because Joseph had already passed, and he comes up and he's like, what are all these foreigners doing in the best land, on the, you know, in the best real estate we've got? And then he enslaves them. And so if you do work out the chronology, they are enslaved for 215 years and they're living large for 215 years. So because they were in Egypt for a total of 430. And, the, and we think of that, 430 years. Our country has not even been in existence for that long. I don't know if we'll make it 430 years if the Lord tarries. But the point is, all of this seems to creep along at a snail's pace which reminds me of a post my daughter-in-law showed on Facebook last night. It had a slug moving across the sidewalk, and it said, this is how my husband, being my oldest son, this is how fast he moves when I ask him to do something. <laughs> and, of course, my wife would say, and he got it honest. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But... 430 years, and we have, we're have we just now beginning to start that parenthetical section, if you will, uh, of the Scripture. And, and we want it, we can't imagine that. 430 years, good grief. You know, we get upset at the McDonald's drive-thru if we have to sit there and wait more than two minutes. If they don't have it ready as soon as you pull up, what is the problem here? Where is the manager? That's how we want... That's how we want things. We don't want any commercials in our TV programs. I can empathize. I, I, I don't like that either. <laughs> empathize. Ronald Reagan, I think, was the greatest president in modern history, but if he did one bad thing, it was deregulate the cable television industry, which allowed them to start showing... Uh, um, advertisements on cable TV. Back in the 70s, there were no commercials on cable TV. We didn't have it back then. 
I just remember seeing it in town and thinking, wow, weird channels, no commercials, this is awesome. But, uh, you know, we don't want any, it, I'm, I'm bad about, when I find one thing to watch, I'm going to find one other. So when the commercial comes on this show, I can jump to the other show, which means I usually miss some of the um, original programming. And to counter this, the devil has entered in, and now all of the stations put their commercials on at the same time. They're in cahoots with each other. That's evil. Pray for that. We want the preacher to hurry up and get through so we can go home and watch TV, you know, without the commercials. And if we could, many of us might even, I don't know if they even still have this, but TiVo Church, you know, where you just kind of record it and then just fast forward it, you know, get to the end and go on. But God doesn't move that way. He knows the end from the beginning. The plan of the ages is playing out, and we have a part to play. Some of us just don't want to get on the stage. We want to fast forward through our part. If there's anything, because we're winding down in, in um, Genesis, and, I'm, and we're, we're, clo- we're, we're speeding up, as, hopefully, as we get to the end of Genesis, but if there's one thing I hope you know, that as we've learned through this book, is that the God that created the universe did so with a plan and he is sovereign and nothing takes him by surprise. We are looking at regular people here. We are reading about regular, normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill people that God is using. We are seeing tragedy in their lives. We are seeing blessings in their lives. We're seeing all the stuff that we see Um, in one way or another in our lives and God worked through it all and the people of faith that are named here lived through it all, moved through it all and clung to their faith in this knowing one thing that the God of heaven knows me and has a plan. And so as we sit around in our microcosmic view our, our uh, myopic view, I should say, and and woe is me, and you know everything is 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 horrible, and my world is horrible, and all that sort of thing. Don't do that. That's a pity party. That's the devil that does that. It's the devil that gives you those ideas, because whatever has happened to anyone else, or whatever is happening to you, it has also happened to someone else. As the Reverend Jasper Williams said, "There's always somebody worse off than you." Just know that. Always a lot of people better off than me also. I've noticed that. But there's, also, there's always someone worse off than you. So like many works of God, Israel has had a slow beginning. From the time that God called Abraham, it took at least 25 years to add one son, Isaac. It took Isaac 60 years to add another son of Israel, Jacob. It took 50 or 60 years for Jacob to add 12 sons and one daughter. But in 430 years, Israel will leave Egypt with 600,000 men. Which if they're all of married age, and I don't know that they were, you probably got at least 600,000 women. Then you got a whole bunch of hundreds of thousands of children. And then the, one of the best things is that the Egyptians paid them to leave. Gave them a severance pack. Enough to, to uh, build a nation. And it took this family here, that we're, which we're reading today, 215 years from grow, to grow from 1 to 70. But in another 430 years, they, grow, they grew to 2 million. The sons of Judah are a special note because this is the Messianic line. This is the Messianic lineage. The line of descent so far goes like this. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Perez, Hezron. You can read that in Luke chapter 3. Notice, Ishmael is not mentioned. He's a child of the flesh, not a child of promise. And a child of the flesh does not enter, inherit the kingdom. It's the wolves that have been born again. It's the child of promise that gets there. Look at verse 28. It says, then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen, which is in the northeastern part of the Nile Delta. The places they stayed, the cities have been found. Canaanite architecture, Canaanite burials, Canaanite um, 
uh, uh, skeletons in those burials. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die since I have seen your face because you are still alive. So the Judah, the Messianic line, goes into Egypt first. Then we see the reunion of Joseph and Jacob, and that's all that Jacob had to see. That's all he had. At that point, he could have died in peace. Now, he's not going to die right now. But at that point, he felt that he could die in peace knowing that his son was still alive. Look at verse 31. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, My brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for their occupation has been to feed livestock, and they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. So it shall, so it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? That you shall say, Your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So here we see Joseph coaching his brothers as to not only what to say, but how to say it. There's a for formal protocol when you go meet the head of a nation, a leader, a king, a pharaoh, as we would call him. It was something for any foreigner, any foreign commoner, let alone a group of shepherds who are considered the lowest of the low, to even be in the presence of Pharaoh. What it takes to see the king which I would liken to us. And old in, later on in the temple period, you, no one could go in but the high priest. Everybody else had to stay outside. Gentiles had their own segregated place. What it takes to get in to see the king, well, they knew somebody. They knew Joseph. They were related to him. What does it take for us to see the king? We've got to know somebody. We've got to know Jesus. And if you've been born again, you're related to him. You're a part of his body. And that's what we see going on here is, is there's some protocol. There was awe and humility as they spoke to Pharaoh. They didn't go in there, you know, they're a bunch of hillbillies essentially. They didn't go in there and go, yeah, man, we just came down here and, you know, we're going to take that pasture up yonder and you can like it or lump it. No, they came in as servants. All humility. This is a pagan king. Serves a, a myriad of gods. But they're still showing humility, honor for the office. And after this short, short course in etiquette, Joseph then went to brief Pharaoh that his family was there and that they would now see him. Chapter 47, verse 1 says, Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. And indeed they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. He didn't say, you know, exactly which ones. It's probably the cleanest, quietest, the, the, the brother that causes all the trouble. They stay, he, kept, they, he stayed in a truck. Verse 3, Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And they said to Pharaoh, We have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no, your servants once again, have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, please, a word you don't hear nearly as much today, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. That's what we call a civil service job. They're usually pretty good with good benefits. So at this point, Joseph brings his brothers in to see Pharaoh. Joseph had already settled them tentatively. I mean, he's already a done deal. There's some formality here. But there, most of the folks or if you look at a map it'll be in the top right hand corner if you look at the Nile it flows north 
And then there's what you call a delta where everything levels out and it fans out. It looks literally like a fan as it runs toward the Mediterranean, the southeastern corner of the Mediterranean. And of course, that's where all the greenery is. You look on a satellite map, it's the same thing today. So up in, in that region, the most fertile, the, the gr best grass, they have been brought there. And Pharaoh says, go ahead. It's well watered. It's normally fertile, though there was a famine at the time, but even though there's a famine and whatever, you still want to be as close to the water as possible. Now we read in chapter 46, verse 34, that all shepherds were seen as abominations to the Egyptians. They weren't trusted then, and they weren't trusted in Jesus' day. They were normally, this is a transient type of job. You know, kind of, they come and they go, and this is usually people that, you know, probably dropped out of school or whatever and just didn't, at, at that time in their lives, just weren't motivated or whatever and just went and got the first thing that came along. They didn't make a lot of money. Um, they were seen to be lazy because, I mean, essentially, most of the time you send them out there and y'all eat and then you camp out under a tree and nap and no iPods or anything like that back then. So it was seen, although it's a very vital job and there's dignity in all labor, the Bible says, but they were seen to be lazy. They were known to steal from their employers. And so when you get to the Gospels and you have these shepherds that, that hear the angels and they go run and see Jesus and they go run telling everybody of what they saw, if you're trying to make something up, if you're just writing a story to try to push your own religion, as some people would say the, the Bible is, especially in the New Testament, you don't have shepherds announcing the coming Messiah. There's no credibility in that. It'd be the same as, you know, some homeless people in bad, you know, hooked on drugs or what have you coming through while I tell you they saw something land on the bridge up there. You don't, there's no telling what they're on. They might be seeing stuff. Whether it's real or not is a different story. There's no credibility there. And then the New Testament has ladies going in the first because they were the first to figure it out and they're the smartest and they pay more attention and that still usually runs true today, especially the details. They come back and they tell the, the apostles, look, we saw Jesus and what does it say? Typical, you know, male response, oh, they're women, they're up, whatever, they've been sniffing Clorox or something. They don't know what they're talking about. And, but let's go check it out anyway. And sure enough, they were right. The point I'm trying to make is, in that patriarchal society, a lot of times women's testimonies weren't even any good in court. So if you're trying to make something up, you don't have women and shepherds as your first prime witnesses. That's all I'm saying. It wouldn't be, I don't, we wouldn't look at it that way today. But back then, you don't do that. That's bad business. You don't write in all the faults of the apostles and all their thickness and dense things they do if you're trying to sell something. But if you're telling the truth and you're recording accurate history, you do write those things because those things do happen in history. So when it comes to shepherds and being sequestered and not being seen as, you know, they're almost not quite subhuman. Any foreigner to an Egyptian was lower, but a shepherd was the lowest of the low. And I think we can learn a spiritual lesson as well as an economic one here. To Jacob's family, keeping their livestock wasn't a job. It was a career. It was a large part of their lives. And there's a vast difference between a job and a career. If you have a job, you know it. If it's just a job, you know it because you grind it out 20, 30, 40 hours, whatever it is, in order to get a check. And say you work Monday through Friday, if you're fortunate. Most probably if you just have a job that you hate, you have to work the weekend and, you know, whatever. But the point is, say you work Monday through Friday, you're going to hate life if it's just a job because you're grinding out 40 hours of the week. Five days out of seven, you're hating life. You're living for the weekend, two days. And then they make us go to church on Sunday. One and a half days. Wow, that's all I get. To, that's the only me time I get. That's the only, you know, and me time is a big thing nowadays. It shouldn't be, but it is. 
And so you're hating five-sevenths of your life. A career is your calling. And you know what they say, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go quite that far. Because I love what I do. But there are some days that are days. And then most of the time it's all right. But there are some days that you go, wow, it's not just a job, it's an adventure. You know. But it was a career to them. They weren't just there to get a check. They were invested in the family business. They were invested in what they did. So economically, we can see that when people are invested in what they do in some way, that it means more to them. All right, that's just common sense. The outcome or this outcome or outlook on things should be heightened with the fact that the family is God-fearing. Colossians 3, 22 says bond servants, and that's a, a, a form of slavery back then. Bond servants obey in all things. It's not chattel slavery or cattle slavery like was practiced here in the United States, but it is a form of slavery. Bond servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, comma, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's to be our attitude when we go to work, whether it's a job or a career. I'm tired of flipping burgers, but well, you're flipping burgers for Jesus. You know, I don't want to flip burgers all my life. I understand that. I did it. I flipped burgers. I mop floors, I stock grocery stores, I unloaded trucks, I loaded trucks. I painted houses, I cleaned toilets. I've done a myriad of jobs. I've had three, most, for most of my life up, to, up until just recently, I've had three jobs. I've been tri-vocational. Sometimes three jobs and pastoring. So work is no, it's not anything uh, new to me. But whatever it is we do, we do it as unto the Lord. When you go to work, you're the best burger flipper, you're the best toilet scrubber, you're the best whatever code writer. I, you know, everybody in here does this. Uh, whatever it is you do, um, I don't know any of it. But whatever you do, you're the best. Be the best at it. And that is to be our attitude when we go to work. But it is also to be our attitude when we come to church. You know, rushing in the morning, getting all, I know, getting kids ready. I'm past that now, praise the Lord, but I remember it. Shut up, get down, get dressed. I don't want to go to get you. Your hair, their hair is like this, and you're trying to, you know, you're in the car, and he's looking at me, and he's looking out my window, and, you know, I, I know. That is not necessarily conducive to worship. But as best you can, don't stay out late. Saturday night, don't stay up too late Saturday night so that you're dragging in here like, like, well, we have a bunch of colloquialisms for that. But don't drag in here looking like that, like the dead. We'll just leave it at that. So, when, And when we serve in the church as well as ser serving others throughout the week, we are to be the best at it. We are to do whatever it is we do as if God was standing right there and we were serving him directly. That's God's toilet you're cleaning. Clean team. Ugh, these people can't clean up after themselves. That doesn't matter. That's why you're here. Job security. And then the pastor gets tired of all the people in the church. <laughs> it's job security. You know, as the pastor said, you know, I don't want the the man who went up that got up that morning and his wife was. Tell them, come on, you got to go to church. And I don't want to go. Nobody likes me there. But you're the pastor. You have to go. <laughs> you know, go anyway. You know, we are to do whatever it is we do as if we were serving him directly, not just any ordinary person. And so, and so that is to be our outlook. That is our worldview, whatever it is. You don't have to flip burgers forever. You know, do whatever it is. It's not meant to be. A job you have forever, honestly. It's meant to be for mostly teenagers, folks working, going through school. 
But at the same time, I understand people do that. But the point is, do it to the best of your ability. That is the practical lesson. That is our outlook. And it's the thing that sets us apart from every other schmo around that's just got shows up and like, yeah, we're put the burger here, you know, drop it on the floor. I, where I flip burgers at McDonald's. You got the 10-second rule. <laughs> you pick it up and throw it back on the grease for a little while, it's good to go. Anybody who's worked in a restaurant knows that. <laughs> Anybody that hasn't knows that if you went into any kitchen, no matter how swanky the restaurant, there are bugs. And if you ever took apart, if you ever taken apart the ice cream machine at these places, you would never eat any ice cream again. Something to leave you with there. <laughs> but the spiritual lesson in all of that is this is that the Egyptians were mindful of agriculture. This is one reason the Nile River was so important to them. It was holy. It was, a, it was a God to them. Every year it overflowed its banks, and when it did, the rich flood sediments fertilized the land. This allowed them to grow crops uh, when others couldn't. So although they were agricultural in one sense, farming was cool to them. Uh, but they weren't inclined to embrace livestock as other cultures did. To them, livestock was simply a necessary evil. All right? To the Hebrews, raising livestock was a way of life. Therefore, their skills at raising animals weren't highly regarded among the Egyptian people. Pharaoh did, however, need someone to keep his animals and was quite happy to give those jobs to the Hebrews because nobody in Egypt wanted to do it. We know how that works here. Therefore, they would be allowed to stay in the land and prosper, but they were still considered unclean and were excluded from the larger part of Egyptian culture. And this is the most important principle we should see today. And that is the principle of being sequestered, being set apart, our sanctification. God brought Jacob and his family down to Egypt for one particular reason to separate them from other people. Because while in Canaan they had begun to intermingle and intermarry with the Canaanites who were pagan to the core. Were the Egyptians pagan? Yes, they were. But the Canaanites were pagan and... Okay, let me put it this way. If you're from Mississippi, you'll appreciate it. You might not appreciate it, but you'll relate to it. The difference between the Canaanites and the Egyptians' paganism is the Egyptian Can uh, paganism is cultured. Canaanite paganism is redneck, hillbilly, run amok. It is nasty. It is sensual to the core. It is just some of the most egregious paganism that there was. It's semi-organized, but it is just, it is just horrible. Either way, he does, God doesn't want the Egyptians uh, hanging around, the, uh, or excuse me, the, the Israelites, the family that would become the Israelite nation, hanging around the Egyptians. And, but when he brings them to Egypt, he has now got a way to sustain them, keeps their culture alive in a good place where they'll be able to make it through the famine and the drought while at the same time they are sequestered, set apart from all the evil, bad culture in Egypt and Canaan. You can't lie down with the dogs and not get up with fleas. And so the family that would one day become a nation by the name of Israel was to be set apart to God and set apart from the world. They were to be different from all other cultures. They were to be a beacon as to how life could be different if you knew the one true God. The Israelite government, when God builds a nation, a theist starts as a theocracy, it was different. Their calendar was different. Their lifestyles were different. Their dress code was different. Their ideas of marriage were different. Examples, and they were different examples of the way that life can be or could be if you knew and followed the one true God. 
And then after Israel floundered due to disobedience, God allowed them to be overrun by the pagans that they so wanted to emulate. And God does that. When you keep reaching for it and reaching for it and reaching for it and reaching for it and God's been holding you back, reaching for it, finally says, he turns loose and says, go ahead and have it. You want it that bad? I'll let you experience it. And it'll be fun at first. But then when your life goes to hell in a handbasket afterwards, you're going to come running back. And you're going to understand why I didn't let you do that. You want to keep a child from, it keeps trying to get to the stove? You know, Caleb, when he was little, he plundered in everything. And finally, one day, he reached out when the stove. He reached out, and uh, I think Robin had him on the hip, and she was ironing and set the thing up. She turned around. Anyway, he, he kept, had kept, kept reaching for the iron. He reached. <sighs> Guess what? That was the last time he ever did that. And then Trey, my oldest son, and I, we took heed of that lesson also, and we haven't touched an iron since. God turned Israel over to the pagan nations that they so readily wanted to emulate, but he will move back to that plan of, of working specifically, and he's still working with his, Israel, working specifically, specifically with them during the tribulation and later on in the latter days. But we've got to understand that. Israel was to be sequestered and different. They weren't weird, not freak, flaky or whatever. They were different. The church has always been at its most powerful when it was countercultural. Study church history. When it absorbs the culture, it is weakened. When it coddles or caters to the culture to try to be liked, it is weakened. When it stands up in the power of God and shows a different face, in a different picture, in a different way, in a different life, in a different worldview, it is at its most powerful. Just read church history. Anytime the church came in, you know, people, oh, Constantine made Rome a, 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 a Christian nation. He did. And you think, wow, that's good. We're not going to get killed anymore for going to church. But it, in actuality, weakened the church in so many ways. Then when the church is persecuted, it grows and it is strengthened and it is seen as something different. We should be seen as different. I didn't say weird, flaky fruits or anything like that. Bouncing off the walls or trying to be more uh, heavenly minded than earthly good or anything like that. But we are to be different. Our worldview, our dress code, our manners, our morality, our appetites are to be different. Not like Canaan, not like Egypt. We are set apart unto God and taken from the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Think of it this way. The boat is in the water. You don't want the water in the boat. It'll sink. If you know what you do when you got a hole in your boat? You got to drill another hole so the water will run out. No, actually, you paddle faster to create a vacuum. Never mind. But, uh, but at this point in history, we the church are to carry out the mandate of being a light unto the world, a light that shines in a different way, giving off a different kind of light. There's all kind of lights. You got neon lights, and those usually get you in trouble. You go to a place of neon lights at night, you are usually not going into a good place. Stay out of there. In the daytime, it's usually a used car salesman. Just stay out of our check cashing place. Stay out of there. But the delight is different. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, segregated as it were, sanctified, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Matthew 5, 13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? That is the earth. How shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And salt was the way... You ever heard of that guy's not worth his salt? You know what that means? Salt was the, one of the ways Roman soldiers got paid. Salt was... You had something if you had salt. So if he's not worth his salt, he's not worth what they're paying him. And once salt had gotten old, 
then they would take it and spread it out on the cobblestone roads of Rome and it kills the grass that grows up in between. So you can either flavor your food with it or another thing they would do if they conquered some land, they salted the fields. You're not planting anything there for a while. Now you're relying on us, Rome would say. You got to come to us for your food. If you act up, we'll just starve you out. So we are to be salt. If we're not flavoring the earth, then we're killing it. You do an experiment, go to your neighbor's yard, <laughs> take some, was it Morton salt, you know? I've done this as a child. And you just write his name in the yard at night and then sit back a couple of days. And he'll wonder, wow, why is my name in my yard in dead grass? Don't do that. Do it in your own yard, but you'll see it work. You got stuff growing up on your sidewalk, pour some salt on it to kill it. You are the light of the world, speaking to the church. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, hide it, but on a lampstand. So it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, not you, Glorify your Father in heaven. That is the purpose of being different. Not weird, not flaky, not handling snakes, not swinging from those chandeliers in the church or anything like that. Different in a good way. So because Jacob's family had chosen to intermingle rather than be different, God moved them to a place where they had no choice but to be left to themselves. God was building and preparing a nation that would take care of His Word. And that's what they did. Kept it. They would take care of His Word and spread it all over the world. By being sequestered, they could build their own culture. There's a lot to be said of Christian culture. Christian culture moves forward. It builds things. Our culture is the result of our worldview. If you want to learn about culture, let me tell you, you read a series of books written by Thomas Sowell, probably one of the most brilliant men this nation has ever known. S O W W E L L. Thomas Sowell. He, uh, I think, he worked for Ronald Reagan. He's got he's got books: uh, Conquest and Culture, Race and Culture, Culture and Culture. It's all kinds of. I mean, it's just historical. The man is brilliant. If I had half his brain, I could do something. But by being sequestered in Egypt, God could build a culture and a worldview because our worldview is the lens through which we see the world and make decisions accordingly. And it creates a difference. You can put on this set of glasses and look at the Grand Canyon and say, ooh, a little bit of water created this over gazillions of years. <laughs> or you can put on the Christian glass and you go, a whole lot of water carved this out in just a short amount of time. Because the other way, the water would have had to run uphill to do it. Figure that one out. But the two have to be nurtured. That is our culture and our worldview. And they have to be taught together. The only way to have a godly worldview is to know God and how He sees things. The only way to have a culture that doesn't destroy itself is to know the Word of God and let it frame the culture. And that's how the country started. I didn't say it was perfect when it started, but that's how it started. And that's why they were wise enough to have a republic and not a democracy, and there's a big difference. Don't say this is a democracy. You don't want a democracy. That's mob rule. A republic runs on laws, a constitution, that is not a living, breathing document. It is a legal document. You don't want those to change. All right? Anybody's ever had any type of contract? You don't want them changing it on you. It's a legal document. It doesn't change. So you don't reinterpret it. All right, it stays that way. And the men, the founding fathers knew that a republic is based on laws that don't change. It doesn't matter what the majority wants. Because the majority can go crazy. The only way to, to have a culture that doesn't destroy itself is to know the word of God and let it frame the culture. By being sequestered in Egypt, God could build this culture and a worldview that would allow Israel to be a nation that would take his word to the world. The USA was built on the same mandate. But as you see, we 
like Israel, have been disobedient. And now the Christian worldview, the worldview that built Europe and then the Western Hemisphere, is now being attacked at every turn. We're taught to feel guilty for what our country has. No. Now many Christians look and act like the world. Now many of our cares are not God's cares, but they are those of, uh, those of what it takes for us to keep up with the Joneses. Who can amass the most toys wins. We should at least take the time each day to sequester ourselves from the world and talk to God in order that we seek His will. See if I can run through this right quick. Verse 7, 47. And Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh, meaning he thanked him, prayed for you know, he didn't stand up and do any of this. He, thank you, bless you for letting us come here. And went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses. It would later be called. Ramesses is not the Pharaoh. But guess what they find when they dig up what was a treasure city in the land of Ramesses in Goshen? Israelite towns. Israelite burials, and up there amongst them, Joseph's tomb with his statue is there, and there are 11 others next to it. Then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, all his father's household with bread according to the number in their families. So Jacob was brought in to see Pharaoh, and he said a couple of important things. First of all, he saw himself as a pilgrim, that is one that is just passing through. This is one thing that allowed him to make such a move of faith by leaving all that he knew, all that he owned, all the land behind. He saw himself as no more than a steward. He was merely taking care of what God had given him. Not mine, 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 mine. That's what children, babies say. It wasn't really his, therefore he didn't attempt to hang on to his worldly possessions. He made the best of them. When God said move, we left it. They'll come back and get it again. If God wanted to move and leave the, the land behind, then that was okay with him. And we should see ourselves as stewards, not owners of what God has given us. This is a game changer when it comes to our homes and our finances. You want your wallet to get saved? And that's the last thing to get saved on people, I'm here to tell you, is their wallet. They'll turn loose of a lot of stuff, but money ain't one of them. So the Lord finally gets a hold of them. That's a game changer. When you realize you're just a steward, that stuff runs through your hands and you're to put it in the right place. Not necessarily hoarded in mason jars in the backyard. Number two, he remarked that his pilgrimage, what his pilgrimage wasn't as long as his ancestors. And we see from this that the lifespan of man was continually dropping from the pre-flood numbers so that by the time we get to King David, the average lifespan will be around 75 this was due to a change in what's called the genetic load and atmospheric pressure and everything else from before the flood. Number three, he blessed Pharaoh, meaning that he showed his humility by thanking and blessing the ruler that blessed them with land and food, although they weren't allowed to eat at his table. Weren't seen as equal, still in humility. He had no hatred in his heart. Thank you for a place to stay. Joseph provided his family with bread and set them up so they could resume their lives in this new land. And God provides us with what we need to pick up our lives when we move from the secular world to the spiritual world. It's just many of us do not take advantage of the resources. We're still hoarding and trying to carry all this stuff with us. You like the Beverly Hillbillies with all this junk and baggage tied on top of the truck and it's barely running. So we see that our faith, this is what I want you to focus on, and the all-knowing, all-powerful God, even in the hard times, can see us through. Not only will it see us through, but it also has a great effect on those around us because they're watching to see how you get through it. You're in a fishbowl whether you like it or not. If you go off the rails, they go, uh-huh, see, I told you. Same thing the devil said. You give Job to me. Let me squeeze him a little bit. He'll quit praising you. He'll quit. And that's what they say. 
And it comes from the devil. If we live our faith by walking and talking in faith, we positively affect those around us. And I'm ta talking about just positive thinking and reading God posts. That, but in turn, that walking and talking can affect the destiny of a whole nation. And is that not what we're asking for in these perilous times? Is that not what we need in America today? And finally, our faith should be like that of Israel. Not like that of Jacob, but they're the same person, yeah. But he acts like Jacob sometimes, and he acts like Israel sometimes. We cannot afford to be schizophrenic or bipolar in our walk. We have to be consistent, even-keeled. And this makes our testimony credible. It's kind of, if you want an example of this, the best example I've ever found is come to the golf course and watch Don Cool play golf. He doesn't hit it the farthest, but it's just consistent. Bumping and running it right down the middle. No matter if he hits a bad shot, he doesn't you know, go crazy. He doesn't accuse me of squirrel hunting when I hit it in the woods like some people do. <laughs> he just talks to himself and gets back up and hits the next shot. That is the way of Christians to live their life. And we need to believe even though we don't yet see the promise. So seek to be sequestered. That is to be set apart to God for His will and not your will because if you go seeking your will, you will wind up down in, in Egypt, the bad part of Egypt, not Goshen. This is a game changer, being sequestered, being set apart, being sanctified. This is the game changer. And I'm convinced that all the frustrations we feel as Christians all the inadequacies, all the underachieving we feel, but we're afraid to co confess are caused by our lack of being set apart to God, our lack of an active prayer life where we seek His face and not just His hands, a prayer life where we just come to Him with a laundry list of what I need, what I need, what I need, instead of God, what do you want me to do? And the I needs begin to take care of themselves. Our lives consist of things habits, areas, actions, and feelings which we feel we need to manage. And there's so much baggage we feel we need to carry. There's so many things with which we feel we cannot part that we're consumed with carrying them around. And carrying all that around is extra. It's dead weight that hinders us in our walk with God. Dump the dead weight. If you ever carried someone that's, that's just limp, that 100-pound kid that's just laying there well, feels like 150 pounds. If somebody's got some tension in their muscles, they feel even lighter. All we need to carry is a love for God and whatever cross He has assigned for us. That's all we've got to carry. Would you all bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, it's all for Your glory. It's all for Your plan. It's all about your will. And it's, we aren't inconsequential because you want us all to play a vital role in the plan. So many of us just don't want to join the team or get on the stage or take a part or plug in or sign our names up for, for some sort of thing you would have us do. Children's ministry. Clean team. Whatever the case may be. Little league. Whatever it is. Prayer warrior. More than a Sunday morning service. It's all for your glory. And if we've come to see it as something else, then Lord, forgive us and let our focus be placed back on you. You are just and true. You are faithful. You will remember your covenant. You will sustain the nation that, that um, falls on its face and turns to you. You will revive the church that falls on its face and turns to you, that does not seek programs or anything else, but simply seeks the will of God and to teach His Word. You will revive and you will build that church, Father, and that's what we want here. That's what we want individually in everyone's life that's here. Lord, if there's someone here that does not know you, and Lord, we can take care of that today. There will be elders 
and their wives in the back. I'll be hanging around during the song if you need prayer. During the song. Afterwards, it's chaotic. But Lord God, it is all about you and your plan and your will and your face and your glory and your name going forth. That is the platform on which we want to stand. And we see here the evidence of a grand plan. And what you do to make us better and how we fight against it, it does not seem right sometimes. Through famine, you bring us to a sequestered or set-apart life. Only to build us up. And it takes some time. Lord, but our time is not your time. Father, let us rest in your timeline and your timetable and your will and your plan. Let us find peace in that, Father. And we thank you for the opportunity, the blessing and the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, who at his appointed time, after a couple of thousand, after 4,000 years it was time, took his part in his place and died and then rose the third day so we could all be saved. And Lord, and now 2,000 years have passed. To us it seems like forever, but it's nothing but a vapor to you. So Lord, whatever time is left on this earth for us as individuals as that, or as the church universal before you come back, we don't know. But God, let us redeem the time and seek your face. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. We pray. Amen.